Center for the Political Future at USC Dornsife. Uh, I'm here with my co-director, Mike Murphy, and with a very special guest on a special day, Robert Costa, the moderator of Washington Week on PBS, uh, an analyst for N NBC and MSNBC, and a Washington Post reporter with extraordinary sources inside the GOP, among Democrats, and a friend since 2012. Robert, I really want to thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to start off with this question. Uh, with Phil Rucker, you wrote about the release of Bob Woodward's new book, Rage, yesterday in the Washington Post. Perhaps the most impactful news is that Trump revealed to Woodward how deadly and dangerous the virus was back in February, said he was going to downplay it, and that's exactly what he did in public. Uh, what is this going to do to the 2020 election? I know Mike has a view on this. I'd like to hear yours. Well, it's great to be with you, Bob and Mike and everyone at USC. I am a Notre Dame man, but so I'm corralled <laughs> into doing this because you two are such good friends. Fred Ryan, the publisher of the Washington Post, is also a USC man. So uh, despite all the old rivalries and tensions between Notre Dame and USC, I have become a fan and friend of USC uh, over the last few years. Well, your, your question's the right one. There's no, there's no uh, debate over whether this book's explosive. You have the president of the United States on tape with Bob Woodward talking on February 7th about a deadly virus that is airborne, as his comments, as you said, were very different uh, publicly. But in terms of what this means for the election, Mike Murphy's tweet may be right. It's kind of TBD. At this point, what makes Woodward more significant to me as a political reporter is that the audio component is allowed to drive the cable conversation in a way and be part of ads like it's already been with Vice President Biden in a way that we haven't necessarily seen from previous books. They don't have audio leaks of the president himself talking through the virus. Uh, why in the world do you think Donald Trump did 18 taped interviews with, with, uh, with Bob Woodward? I'm not surprised I mean, I, at all. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> well, I've had a bit of a personal experience in seeing this relationship up close. In March of 2016, uh, Bob Woodward wanted to get an interview with then-candidate Trump. And I was working as a Trump beat reporter at the time. And I knew Woodward well. And he's been a mentor and, of sorts and friend at the Washington Post. And so we decided to interview candidate Trump together. And we went to the Trump Hotel in, in Washington when it was not even complete. And we sat in this room that was kind of full of building materials. And I could see instantly in, in 2016 that then Mr. Trump had this generational rapport with Woodward, two men at the time in their 70s, still are, who come from totally different experiences and worldviews, but are, are, are both men of a certain age and he respects Woodward as because of the Watergate story. He's a name that he's seen throughout the decades. And to President Trump, that matters, that connection to history, that celebrity. And so he wanted to, to listen to Woodward, hear Woodward. And so he gave this long interview. And in the course of that interview, President Trump, then candidate Trump, said to us, real power, real power, I don't even want to say the word, is fear. And that became the title of his Bob Woodward's first book, Fear, all from that March 2016 interview. And then when Woodward called me a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, I guess a few weeks ago, months ago, when he, the book's title came out, he gave me a heads up and he said, the new title's Rage. And the title of this book, Rage, comes from that same exact interview where President Trump has another quote that really stood out to Woodward. <laughs> I bring the rage out, I always have. Uh, and so to answer your question in a long way, winding way, why did Trump talk to Woodward? because President Trump at his core is someone who is on his own PR man. When I used to see him at Trump Tower as a campaign reporter before he even started to run, this is someone who wanted to control his own PR, be his own spokesman. Sometimes Michael Cohen would be in the room, sometimes Corey Lewandowski would be there, but oftentimes it would just be Hope Hicks and President Trump doing his own thing. And he did a lot of these interviews outside of the infrastructure of the White House, making late night calls to Bob Woodward. Yeah, I think the idea of uh, Donald Trump passing on big A-level press attention is like Dracula getting, you know, more interested in yogurt than blood. 
It's just who <laughs> Trump is. And, you know, Trump has that need. And so here we are. Also, you got to give credit to Woodward. He has a well-polished routine, which he's been doing for 30 years. You know, you get the phone call. I've been through this. I'm sure, Bob, you have. Hey, it's Bob Woodward. Where I'm writing a book on the campaign. Everybody's bringing up your name. We ought to talk. And you're thinking, oh, hell. And next thing you know, you're, t you're talking. Um, though if you're Trump and you have a lot to hide, you don't talk. You don't do the interview. And God forbid you don't have tapes. Uh, but to Bob's earlier point, I don't know what the impact of this will be because now there is tape, but my instinct, which is what I tweeted, is that everything is so dug in right now that while Anderson Cooper is going to be on oxygen and Chris Cuomo screaming at the camera and our friends at MSNBC are swinging from the chandeliers over it because legitimately it's horrifying. It is, a, it's the worst transgression it makes Watergate, you know, look like a speeding ticket. But out beyond the Beltway, in my old hometown of Detroit, where Woodward is a big avenue through Oakland County, where they do classic car festivals, I'm not sure it moves the needle that much. We're going to find out. I do think of some of these national security folks, which is kind of the other story of the book beyond COVID, that all the people who have to deal with the bad actors in the world think that Trump is a toddler and a danger. If they start saying publicly now on television cameras, and most of them are generals and people with uh, impeccable credentials as public servants. In the wake of the veteran disaster Trump has already got himself into, if they start saying this stuff publicly, um, uh, I think there could be a drip, drip, drip. And finally, with 56 days to go and Trump behind in all ways, every day that's not a day that Trump can use to go after Biden and try to change the topic of the election, it, when that doesn't happen a day, a day like that, it's a great day for Biden. So on that level alone, this is a huge problem for Trump, because once again, he's talking about his problems, not Joe's. Yeah, I, I disagree slightly about the potential impact of this. I think it's water cooler conversation. I think pe people can easily understand it. It's quite different from the Mueller report, which was confused, distorted, and in the end, ultimately impenetrable. But I think you're absolutely right about this being a constant distraction for Trump. The Trump campaign has no control of message. And if you have no control of message in a campaign, a presidential campaign especially, you're in a very bad place. Uh, Robert, do you think we're gonna see some more revelations? I mean, we've had an extraordinary week with the, the Atlantic story on soldiers being losers uh, and suckers, uh, the, 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 the Woodward story, the the whistleblower complaint at DHS. I mean, is this just going to keep rolling, do we think? It, it's growing every day. I mean, you're right about the whistleblower complaints. These are serious stories put on top of the pile, a pile that grows by the day in terms of controversies and scandals. Uh, but to Mike's point, when you're reading this book, Rage, I spent a few days reading it and taking notes. You see these jarring comments from former Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, General Mattis, John Kelly, the former chief of staff, who's also part of that Jeffrey Goldberg story in terms of who was in the room when President Trump was saying these comments allegedly about um, veterans. If these men and women around the president come forward, General Kelly, General Mattis, Dan Coates, Senator Coates, and put on camera, on tape, what they're allegedly saying behind the scenes, whether as a source or to an associate in a Bob Woodward book, it could have power on top of the audio from the Woodward book. But part of the challenge for reporters now uh, is that there's so many relevant, yeah. important, vital stories going on that we're covering. But I would not sit here and start to argue with you that they're all breaking through. I think the Washington Post and the New York Times and AP and others are spending a significant amount of time reporting on important things that are happening. But whether it's social media, uh, just the avalanche of information, uh, it's hard to say what exactly, if anything, will be the ultimate burden on President Trump's shoulders politically, if anything at all. You know, one of the most uh, interesting things that's kind of come across my desk in the last three weeks, I, I looked in on some Zoom focus groups in Florida, which in many ways is the most important state this year where Joe Biden has a small lead and has maintained that lead for a while. That's a backbreaker for Trump if he can't win it. And these were focus groups around the state of soft Republican and independent voters 
who might be leaning one way, but don't have a candidate, are not committed to either Biden or Trump. And when COVID came up, it sounded very different than what you hear in kind of the elite media. They were saying, look, we know Trump's kind of a clown and there were problems with the response, but the disease, contrary to what the media tells us every day, is not Trump's fault. It could have happened to anybody. Um, and of course, it's hard to deal with. It would be hard to deal with for any president. I was stunned at how much leash they gave him on COVID. And it'll be interesting to me if hearing the tapes of the Cavalier attitude changes that, because I was, I was frankly shocked, and it was true of every single group out of seven, that there was this kind of not a, there's no enthusiasm for his response, but they consider it generic. In other words, any president would have had trouble, unfair to single him out. So I wonder if the tapes will make him a villain here. I, that's my biggest question about the impact of the book beyond the national security stuff, Bob, you're, you're talking about. What do you think the next thing could be, Bob? What, what's out there on your antenna? Because I agree with Bob's presumption and in, in your answer that there's always something coming with this guy, and he likes to be in the center of attention one way or the other. Um, do we think we'll see some high-level resignations finally? Old Anonymous is still out there. That could continue the narrative if that person goes public. Um, what's your gut on what be, might, might be coming around the bend? Well, my gut is based on kind of what I've been covering over the last few weeks. And while Woodward is the hot story right now on Thursday afternoon, what you're really seeing in this country is a succession of racial violence episodes, white police officers, black Americans being killed uh, that began in a way to become a national reckoning with George Floyd, but now with Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. These incidences, these tragedies have been kind of week after week, month after month, and have defined the year. And we did a big story in the Washington Post I did with my colleague Robert Klemko earlier this week about suburban voters outside of Milwaukee who are so key. And Biden has a path in Milwaukee, but it's going to depend on, excuse me, he has a path in Wisconsin, but it's going to depend on enormous turnout, at least compared to the Clinton turnout in the city of Milwaukee, try to up his numbers yeah. in western Wisconsin, cut into Trump a little bit in northern Wisconsin and, and in the suburbs. So my, to answer your question, race has been such a defining issue along with the pandemic uh, that while Woodward is hot and it is a legitimately hot story, if there's another incident of police violence uh, with black Americans, it, 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 you could see that law and order white grievance appeal from President Trump rear itself back into the political headline and, and to the fore of the national debate. Yeah, I think he's gonna return to that. It's gonna keep trying to do it. Uh, I, they obviously sent him out on Labor Day to do an economic message. <clears throat> that they were having a super V-shaped recovery, but he couldn't help himself. As soon as he was off the teleprompter script, he was right back to that. One of the things that's been remarkable to me so far is in a whole series of polls, uh, Biden has led Trump on who can handle the disorder, on criminal justice, on how to deal with the police. Why do you think that is? Is it because Trump himself seems like such a disruptive force that people don't see how he can bring about any kind of calm? Well, I'd love to hear Mike's answer to that as well, because I was talking to this state representative from Milwaukee suburbs named Robin Vining. She's a Democrat. She's one of the rare Democrats who's won a state legislative seat in those conservative Milwaukee suburbs. And to answer your question, Bob, she said, the voters in Wisconsin, of course, there, a lot of them are Trump voters. The GOP in Wisconsin has been Trumpified to a point. But there's a lot of civility-minded kind of moderate Republicans who don't like the hardline approach in their view of President Trump. And that may be different in a place like Wisconsin compared to, say, Florida, in terms of how they're responding to President Trump's appeals. And Robin Vinings and other Democrats in Wisconsin who I spoke with, they said the support for Trump in many of these towns around Milwaukee is somewhat soft. And, and if it's softer in the Milwaukee suburbs, softer in the Philadelphia suburbs, on law and order, uh, but it, it, it may harden a lot of Republicans say the president's support in northern Wisconsin, for example, where a lot of fear among rural voters in that state, according to my Republican sources, they're, they're being driven even more to President Trump's side by what's happening. Yeah, it's a tricky equation. And, and Bob, you're absolutely right. Trump's going to have something to work with uh, in kind of the northern and, and northeastern 
part of Wisconsin. But if the suburbs, which are just bigger, stay against him and he can't rally them, you know, he's going to have real trouble there in the upper Midwest. His dream of winning Minnesota, a state last time that he lost by about 40,000 votes, pretty close, about a point and a quarter, I think. You know, that's their big secret plan in Trump world to try to grab that. And they're going to have the same problem because in the upper Midwest, you do have that older tradition of kind of good government reform Republicans. And uh, um, the kind of racial tension stuff he's selling is, is, is tricky. I thought the Biden campaign did a decent job with a very big decision they had to make because no Democratic campaign wants to debate law and order uh, as their big argument. But because of this unrest, they knew it was coming. So they had to decide, do they give a big speech and try to move on? Or do they give a big speech and spend some advertising money trying to beat the issue to a, a close draw and exhaust the issue and then be able to pivot into something else in the last, say, eight or nine days of this month leading up to the big debate on the 29th of September, which is an important moment in the campaign. And they opted to do that. I think they committed about $40 million in those swing states, which is a big ad buy, at the exact same time that the Trump campaign was hitting cash flow problems because they'd insanely blown through $800 million in spending on bad TV ads that were driven more by Trump's whims than smart messaging and a lot of prospecting with paid ads on the internet to find new small donors, a money machine uh, stuff. They'd blown all this money, so Biden's been able to outspend them on TV and, and beat a bad issue, not quite to a draw, but I think he's taken the, the sharpness off a lot of the blade for Trump. You know, it, it hasn't been the home run Trump wanted. You can see in the polls that Biden's holding his own. I also think the Biden campaign kept what scares me as a, an anti-Trump Republican who's rooting for Biden. Uh, he, the Biden campaign kept its woke department under control, which could have put him down a road to be on the wrong side of rioting, legitimizing it, and given Trump a bigger club to work with. So. The question is the one you you brought up, which I think is right on target. Will there be another incident or two, or will Biden be able to pivot into what Biden wants to talk about, coronavirus uh, incompetence becoming economic incompetence going into October? The only other thing I'd say is I think October could really be the month of vaccine politics because there's, you know, people want a vaccine. They want good news. And so will Trump be able to manipulate that to the point where there's some mania where people just decide, oh, thank God, it's going to be over by Christmas. I'll get my shot. Don't have to worry anymore. My store will open or I'll get my job back. And now it's all about the economy where Trump does have an advantage right now in perception over Biden. And then Trump will have the last two weeks of October being about what he wants, which is the economy. So the Biden campaign has some work to do on Trump there, and they need to get you know off the law and order message, which is just not their turf, even though they're tactically doing well, and on to that. And that's what I'll be looking for in the first debate. What, it, what is it about riots and law and order and Kamala Harris being liberal, or is it about Trump's failures and the danger of the economy? You, you know, I'm gonna disagree a little bit there because I think the way Trump has handled the whole vaccine situation has created and seeded all of these doubts. If Anthony Fauci announces that there's a vaccine, people are going to believe it. If Donald Trump announces there's a vaccine, I think people are going to be very, very skeptical. I think if he had started off by saying, we're going to have Operation Warp Speed, we're going to do this as quickly as we can, and the medical professionals will make the decision that he'd be in a lot better shape. I just don't think he has the credibility to tell us there's going to be a vaccine. Yeah, we're, we're finding out. I just, the human psychology is to want to believe. That's why, you know, Madoff raised a lot of money and we sell a lot of easy diet books in America. But Trump does have credibility problems. And some of the new yes. polling that's out uh, from Kaiser shows there's fear about a vaccine. And yeah. so, no, but you got to be careful. I thought Kamala made a huge mistake a few days ago, kind of talking about how she didn't trust a vaccine, didn't trust Trump. I don't think the Democrats want to be on the side of rooting against a vaccine. I think that's very dangerous territory. And I, I think they thought so too, because they rolled back the comment later in the day. Well, the, on the vaccine uh, point, just real quick, I think the key thing is going to be the integrity of any announcement. If it's Stephen Hahn under pressure at the FDA, and it seems like uh, he, he's doing something that's not appropriate, then the Democrats could have an opening to say President right. Trump's having a, a created October surprise. 
And a lot of this is going to depend on pharma and the pharmaceutical companies. Do they really stand there and endorse President Trump at a Rose Garden announcement in October, should there be one about a vaccine? Because the president's already teased. He, he, he thinks there's going to be some yeah. big vaccine announcement in October. The credibility of that, and that's why public information and integrity are going to matter. If the fact checking is that this is kind of being spun by President Trump, will that break through? Uh, or will this, there be, as you said, this willful uh, this willful, this willfulness out in the American electorate to try to just believe President Trump. Or just believe the idea of a vaccine. Though I, I give the pharma guys credit for announcing they're going to have their own controls. And it was no small deal that Trump two weeks ago tried to stuff the FDA communications office with political hacks to try to control the voice of the FDA. And that luckily, it appears the professional staff there pushed back. So that, that was a good sign. You know, if I were Biden, by the way, I would go appoint Bill Gates, my uh, vaccine czar for next year to be able to, you know, be in charge of the logistics job of, of, of sourcing it, tracking it, all that stuff, because that would give him a badge to be in the media every single day as the, as the other Fauci. And I think that would be a good idea for them to do. I don't know if he'd want to do it, but he has the credibility, I think, that could dominate that debate. So, so we've talked about the Woodward story, which I actually think will have some traction because COVID is such a central concern for the electorate. We've talked about the Trump campaign facing a real cash crunch. <laughs> We've talked about the Atlantic. And Robert, I wanna ask you this question. What do other Republicans, elected Republicans, what do they privately think about what's going on in this campaign? Well, it's the, it's the same old story in some ways, but it's a little different, Bob. I mean, I've been saying for three and a half years, based on my reporting, that this is a party that's privately aghast at many of the things President Trump's doing. But what matters in politics is what you do publicly, what you say. Mm -hmm. And so they're very muted publicly because they have fear of his, his wrath. But more than fear of his own wrath, it's not really the fear of the tweet. What really comes through in conversations with senators and, and House members who know politics, who aren't people who cower in fear of most things in their political lives, they don't want to have their voters revolt. And it's not even about losing a primary for many of them, is they just don't want to be on the wrong side of the party. They're party people, they're people who appreciate being in power. And this is a party that has made a bargain with President Trump. I mean, they, that's why that Supreme Court, I was talking to a White House official yesterday, the Supreme Court announcement extending his list of possible nominees. It's all kind of a nod to those religious voters, whether they're Catholics or evangelicals uh, of the Jewish faith or anyone who really prizes kind of a conservative, religious tilted judicial nominee for the high court or other courts. The White House is working them as a, as a, a voting block at every turn. And it's not just about Pence. It's about we've given you, in their eyes, the White House is arguing these nominees, these policies, despite the president's character and his history, so you better stick with us. And one of the things, Mike and I used to talk about this a lot when he was working for the Jeb Bush cause, is that these voters on the, on the right side of the Republican Party, who I've covered now for a decade, they grew tired of losing with the Mike Huckabees of the world, Rick Santorum in 2012. They put their chips with these candidates who were like them. And then in 2016, they said, to heck with that. We don't need anyone like us. We just need someone who's going to win Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and nominate judges we like. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think the conversation that's happening now in every, every Republican campaign that's in some jeopardy is pretty simple. The candidate calls up the pollster with the campaign manager listening and says, damn it, I'm losing. Trump's killing me. And they all talk about how crazy Trump is for five minutes. And then the pollster says, well, here's the problem. Trump's going to lose your state or your congressional district. But 75% of the people who are voting for you, and you're only down five points, are for Trump. So you go out against Trump tomorrow and you pick up a few moderates, but you're going to tell 75% of the people you need to win to go screw themselves. And then the candidate gets frustrated and there's some circular talk and they don't do anything about Trump. Then the pollster calls the campaign manager and says, uh, can you pay my invoices because we're going to lose. Uh, so they're stuck. If they had a time machine to go back 18 months for a Cory Gardner, senator from Colorado, to go back to the old Cory Gardner and keep some distance and build a brand, it's interesting to me that in a, in a tougher state than most, Susan Collins is still showing some life 
because she still has some of that old brand of independence. Now, the Democrats will say, no, 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 that's all lie. But she has that in Maine. She doesn't have as much as she used to, as she'll probably lose. But for the rest of them, they've given it away, and there's no getting it back. So they're just going to be a cork on the Republican ocean. And if you're not in a good Republican state, let alone a slightly tilt state, you know, you, you very good chance you're going to get beat, particularly in the Senate. And there's really nothing they can do about it. It's out yeah. of their hands now. Yeah. In, in our uh, USC Dornsite polling, uh, which President Trump, as you may recall, used to quote all the time in 2016 because it indicated that he had a real chance to win, uh, he's, as of this morning when I checked, 12 points behind. He's losing the suburbs by double digits. And even among groups that voted heavily for him, like rural agricultural groups, instead of winning three to one, he's winning two to one. How does he turn that around? It's going to be very difficult because he doesn't have a, a wide array of political tools at his beck and call. But I'm kind of curious to throw it back to you a little bit, Bob, is what do you make of this idea of the quiet suburban white voter who's not talking to the pollster? Is that a political fiction or is that something we have to factor in? Well, I'll just talk about our poll. Our poll, we recruit 6,000 people. We recruit them by... Uh, they get a letter in the mail. It's sent by zip code. Uh, they become a panel. Uh, and they're not just polled about politics. They're polled about a whole set of issues for the Center for Economic and Social Research at USC. So they have a very continuing relationship. And it's a kind of relationship of trust with the pollster. So that's one of the reasons why I think uh, the USC Dornsife poll showed Trump doing better than other polls did in 2016. Telephone polls I'm extraordinarily skeptical about. I don't know what, how Mike feels about this. Well, telephone polls have become harder to get a good sample. They still work, but they take 10 days to field now, you know, because it, you have to make 100 calls to get one complete of some of the tougher demography. Um, you know, I, I think there is a quiet Trump vote that under polls a little, but with good polling by asking other questions, you can kind of build a model. If somebody says, uh, totally undecided on Trump, but boy, oh boy, I'm tired of that Black Lives Matter and that Washington swamp is a huge problem. And it's about time we had somebody standing up for American trade jobs. You, you can kind of, you don't have to be Kreskin to figure out probably where they're going to vote, if they're going to vote. Um, so, you know, but to the question of, can Trump get it back? I don't think he can, but I think Biden can get it back for Trump. You know, Joe Biden's an uneven candidate. He was very good at his convention speech. If he can keep performing at that level, uh, he's going to be able to keep control of the race. But if we get back to clumsy Biden and he has a bad first debate and we do have a vaccine tulip thing that people are believing, not just because Donald Trump says so, but because the trials start leaking in our digital journalism world that scientists at Pfizer are very promising. You know, we, we get kind of that information, even if it's not official yet. And it's all about the economy and the close. And Trump can get sedated and shut up long enough for the Republican campaign to run their standard hits. I mean, Kamala Harris is very liberal. Uh, <laughs> Biden has a long record with a lot of targets in it. And they start to add economic and taxation fear to them. And all those pieces come together with the law and order thing never going totally away. It's a long shot, but if Biden loses kind of ball control here and the agenda gets the stuff that's better for Trump in October, it's not impossible. And, you know, and Vice, President just, Biden's gonna, Vice President Biden is going to be tested on that, Mike. Yep. I mean, I, I just keep thinking back to 2016 when I was at Washington University in St. Louis and I got a message from Bannon and other campaign officials saying they, they were going to bring accusers of President Clinton on, on sexual misconduct uh, issues to the debate to kind of parade in front of Secretary Clinton and President Clinton. They were going to pull that stunt in their mm -hmm. eyes politically to, to jar the Clinton campaign, to throw them off balance. Who knows what President Trump could do at these upcoming three presidential debates? Uh, he's proven before debates to kind of loom over candidates, to, bring, to pull those kind of stunts. And he has Rudy Giuliani and others around him now advising yeah. him. So that, to me, is the big variable. What does Biden yep. do in the spotlight when President Trump comes out of left field with something no one's expecting? And Biden has a temper. He can be provoked. 
Yeah, I actually think he'll be very good at that moment. Uh, and I, the reason for this is I watched the 2012 debate with Paul Ryan again. And Biden was spontaneous. He was effective. And in the primaries, I just think putting him on stage with nine or 10 or 12 other Democratic candidates, he was very uncomfortable. He didn't like it. And you could tell. But if you watched him in the last debate with Bernie Sanders, I think he was quite good. I also have to add to, to something Mike said or respond to something Mike said. The idea that Donald Trump is somehow or other going to get control of himself and let the strategists run the campaign uh, seems a fairy tale to me. Well, I think it's uh, unlikely, it, but you just can't say impossible. I mean, well, okay. I, I'm with I, you, Bob. I know what the odds are, but you got to admit okay. it is possible for Joe Biden to make an error. And sure. it is possible for the Republicans to get a better offense going. Um, you know, do I think it's likely? No, I think he's like, okay. I've been saying for like two years, I think he's going to lose. But there is, there are scenarios where the race tightens. Yes. And, and I think people want to concede that, want to say it, uh, at least to cover themselves, number one and number two, because it's true. It could happen. Uh, but right now- hey, I can't hear you guys for the second. I apologize. Uh, can you hear me out. now? I can hear you now. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. I think the likelihood that Trump could come back, I agree with Mike, uh, it's the odds are very long, uh, but it's not completely impossible. Uh, and the, uh, the notion that Biden could make a big mistake, sure he could. But so far the Biden campaign has shown remarkable message discipline. I was uh, quite uh, impressed the other day uh, when the Atlantic story had come out and, uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the Biden story, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 your story had come out that Biden didn't spend the whole day on that story. He stayed on the economy. He stayed on the economy. It was not like what Hil if, in Hillary Clinton, when the Access Hollywood tape hit, that campaign went after it as a bright shining object. And they never got to stage two or stage three of their argument. Stage two was, Trump, by the way, as a businessman, mistreated his workers and stiffed his contractors. Stage three was, and his economic plan isn't going to help you, it's going to hurt you. They just stayed with that. What Trump did, what Biden did yesterday was condemn Trump uh, on the revelations about uh, that, that were in the Woodward book. And then he went and set out his economic plan, and they put an ad on the air in Michigan about the economic plan. Exactly the opposite of what Clinton did. Now, and you see, you see uh, in the Washington Post today, my colleague Erica Warner has a story uh, about how the economy could be turning in Biden's favor based on cer certain polls on the economy. And that's, to me, the thing that really hasn't been tested yet. The, the yeah. country's been suffering from this pandemic. And when does that really start politically to become a, a challenge for President Trump? Yeah, if, geopolitically, it's Florida. But, but message-wise, it's the economy. If Biden can move that number, it's done. Yeah. Trump's last escape hatch is gone. But I thought that was a shortcoming of an otherwise very competent convention for Biden. They have not until very recently really prosecuted the economic argument. And I think that's the one missing piece. So I'll be curious to see what that looks like between now and the day after the debate on the 29th. You know, have they made a dent between advertising, campaign work, and the debate? And maybe both of you can talk about this. Why do you think Biden has been catching up and in some polls actually doing slightly better than Trump on the economy? You know, Why I, is that I'm seeing it, well, I'm not sure that's true, Bob, to be honest. It is a mishmash of polls on that going every which way. You know, some he's, he's a little ahead, some, places some he's a little and, ahead, so. some, he, some Trump's a little ahead, some he's a little behind or it's a tie. Well, no, I mean, I, I, no, this should I, have been I, his I, big, it, big advantage. I can tell you, at least maybe we're looking at different polls, but but it's generally a five to seven point deficit. I've seen new data in Florida at eight points. But well, you, a lot of, remember, polls are what happened, to, you know, eight days ago. And we were, eight days ago, we were just entering the veterans problem. Yeah. So I'll be a little more interested next week, particularly now that Biden's starting to prosecute the case. Yeah. But I, I, I don't agree that there's been a big closing in the polling because I, I look at this stuff pretty closely. I haven't seen it. Well, I think you ought, to look at this, but, you ought uh, to look at this Washington Post story this morning because I thought it was very telling. If, the, if Trump loses the economy, he's losing every other internal. Oh, and yeah, by the that way, kills him. He's, I, I mass, totally agree. 
he's massively behind on cares about people like me, which right. in many ways is the most predictive polling question. It was the polling question that uh, Barack Obama was winning, the internal that he was winning in 2012 when Romney was winning all sorts of other internals. But it was the one that told the tale about what the outcome was going to be. Uh, one reason I see Biden, when you watch what the Republicans did at their convention, constantly talking about socialism. And they had all these speakers with Cuban roots referring to their, their, their escape from Cuba and communism and the perils of socialism. And Biden has countered that by going back to Scranton, by underscoring his own, his uh, working class background, middle class background. And he's tried to, you know, not be boxed in as this establishment Democratic candidate, even though he's been in the Senate or vice president going back to the 1970s. And and he's benefited in a sense. The pandemic has brought the economy forward in a way that it, it may not have been a thing he could focus on with any real emphasis if the stock market was at 30,000 and the unemployment rate was way down. Uh, but the pandemic has changed the entire economic debate. And he's sitting there as a candidate who grew up in, in Scranton and has this, he has ties to the unions. Uh, and he's not been defined by Trump if, as this Green New Deal candidate. They're trying to say he's socialist or he's gonna be soft on the socialists in the party, the democratic socialists, but it, that's, that's just not, se it's not seeming to stick when I'm talking to Democrats out there in the field and voters. Yeah, Biden has the right persona to resist that. He's kind of a lunch pail Democrat. Now, again, I'll say, I think the Biden campaign is doing exactly the right thing with the biography and kind of the working class vibe he has because they need to. And I agree that the Trump campaign has been unable to define Biden. But what struck me from, again, some of this Florida stuff is how, how little people know about Joe Biden. It's the classic challenger where they're mostly about firing Trump. And what they know about Biden is kind of likable old senator. And the more the Biden people can fill that in, the better they're going to do. So I think that's all totally appropriate. And it, it appears to be working. But I if I were working for the Biden campaign, I would not feel overconfident that my candidate is still not well, vulnerable. To that to point, defined. Mike, if you're the Biden campaign, do you bring out President Obama every day in the final month or not? Or I Bob? bring him out a lot. I don't know about every day because I don't want to turn myself into Ed McMahon. I'm running for president. <laughs> but I would use him surgically. What I would be doing, and I've been saying this on Hacks on Tap for six months, uh, I've been saying prosecute, you know, kitchen table economics. Don't let Trump own that if the virus backs off. And surround Biden with surrogates who are credible because nobody thinks Joe Biden is a domestic policy wizard. And, you know, what he needs is to be surrounded by an economic recovery team. And the Democrats have a lot of credible Tim Geithners out there from the good old days, the Robert Rubens, who, are in, who can be the grownups the help led by Biden to bring the economy back, which is the perfect contrast to incompetent Trump with his palace intrigue and in-laws and stupidity. So I think there's a big opportunity for the Biden people to thicken all that out with a, a, one of the smartest things Biden has done in this cop fight is flip the argument that, wait a minute, Trump is the arsonist fireman. He creates these problems. You think the cities will be on fire if I'm president? You'll be safer with me. And, you know, I would keep prosecuting that. It's a good argument. But I would add, and I, I'm going to have the 12 smartest economic people last 10 years be in charge of fixing the damage here once we're done sweeping all the, all the toys and corruption out of the Trump White House to get you back to work. And I think there's just an opportunity there to bring in the A-team to contrast with the Jared Kushners of the world. And for whatever reason, they haven't done it. And I would not hang it all on Joe. They got, they got, they got to make up that gap. I think it's a little complicated to bring back uh, Tim Geithner or Larry Summers, I think that could create internal tensions inside the Democratic Party. That's why I think they haven't done it. Uh, but we'll see where this goes. I think, I think what we ought to do now is turn this over to questions. And that's going to give Mike a lot of control because he's going to ask the questions. Oh, exactly. That's the way Putin taught me to do it. <laughs> uh, from Beth Meyerwitz to all panelists except Bob. No, I kid. Uh, do you think that the news about Trump this week will have an impact on down ballot races, especially Senate races? For example, in South Carolina, boy, people are psyched up about <laughs> Lindsay's race. And in Iowa, both 
Republican states with senators, at least in Iowa, in pretty tough contests. What do you guys think? Well, uh, I was joking with some reporter friends the other day when Tucker Carlson on Fox News goes after Lindsey Graham for connecting Trump with Bob Woodward. Uh, I said, it'll be five minutes before some Democrat in South Carolina cuts that Tucker Carlson segment into an ad <laughs> to try to depress Republicans about Graham in South Carolina. Because Jamie Harrison has this, uh, he's doing really well with fundraising, the Democrat down there. But does it affect down ballot races? Maybe in a strange case if Graham actually is blamed, but it doesn't seem like the president's picking up on that theme at all in terms of blaming Graham for the Woodward book. I, I think there, there's going to be accountability for the virus in suburban heavy states if it continues to explode right around October. Uh, if, it's, if it explodes, hopefully it doesn't with the flu and that kind of thing. Uh, the virus and Republicans and their handling of the president could come back and be a real issue. But it's, I just, we, four or five days ago, we were all Kenosha. Now it's all Woodward book. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree. I, I think down ballot is tough. I mean, it might nudge Iowa a little more. That's an even race. And uh, whatever is bad for Trump is bad for her. Yeah, and she made the terrible mistake of quoting this preposterous statistic that only 6,000 people have died uh, of COVID, and which came out of a conspiracy theory on the internet. And she got a lot of blowback in the state of Iowa. I think the effect of Trump on down ballot races depends immensely, in, entirely, on whether or not Joe Biden wins by a little or a lot. If he wins by a lot, then I think you'll see a big impact on down ballot races. These races tend to tighten up. Uh, so this is a question from Tim Beering, and I apologize, Tim, if I got your name wrong uh, and pronounced it wrong. Any opinion or any view on the question of Will Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York, make former mayor, make good on his promise to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to support the Democratic candidate? Seems like it would be helpful in expensive media markets like those in Florida and Texas. And, and let me say that uh, Mayor Bloomberg has announced he's spending $60 million several weeks ago to help Democratic congressional candidates. And every town, his, uh, his group for uh, some gun laws like background checks is spending millions of dollars, including a fair amount in Florida. But the questioner is right. We have not heard from the mayor about, he kind of implied he was going to spend a lot of money on the uh, presidential race. What are you hearing out there, Bob? Um, Bob Strum, you want to start or you want me to start? Uh, well, I'm skeptical <laughs> myself. I'm skeptical. I, th I think that uh, he probably intended to do this. And when he got on that debate stage uh, with the other Democrats, you notice Biden was very careful not to go after him during that debate. Uh, and I think they understood what was at stake, but he was lacerated by some of the other candidates. And I think he's still very unhappy about it. Uh, so I'm skeptical that he's gonna spend anywhere near three or $400 million. Well, I, think, I think that's right. Based on my conversations with Bloomberg Associates, he is still, I mean, I would use the word bitter based on what I've heard about that experience. And just to go on down a tangent for a second, I really think one of the counterfactuals, one of the what ifs of 2020, we're all going to look back. What if Bloomberg had not appeared at that debate? If Bloomberg had kind of done his own thing and stayed out of the, stayed out of the arena where he got lacerated, as you said, I mean, could he have really held on and gone one-on-one -on -one against Biden with more money, uh, more of a machine. To me, that's the big w what if, because uh, yeah. anyway. Yeah, we will see. We will see. There's still time. I thought he had a great media opportunity the other day when Trump was rumored to be thinking about putting $100 million of his own money in, which nobody who knows Trump thinks he'd ever do. But <laughs> Bloomberg could have said, I'll put in $2 million. <laughs> That's what real billionaires do, Donald. Uh, and I know Bloomberg wants to... Uh, Trump to lose. So if the polls tighten a little, that could be a stimulus despite whatever hangover might exist from the rude treatment he got from many Democratic activists for the great sin of being a capitalist. Uh, so a question <laughs> from Mark Donahue, another why haven't we heard question. This one, why haven't we heard from George W. Bush? And do you think we will before the election? Bob Shrum? No, I'm going to throw that to Bob Costa. <laughs> Well, I remember um, at, during President Trump's inauguration, I was at the Capitol standing right by the door 
where the former presidents came out after listening to President Trump's American carnage speech and President Carter and Mrs. Carter said hello, very kind of Georgia nice. And, and then President George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, walked by and Bush looked bewildered. And he, I asked him, what do you think of the speech? And he, he kind of just like shook his head and I got it on video. It was just a funny scene. He just seemed bewildered by the whole thing, American carnage and President Trump. But he's been quiet painting. I, I mean, his, he seems to relish being a private citizen. Robert Draper has this fascinating new book out called To Start a War and really goes in depth about the Bush administration bringing this, this nation into war, intervening into Iraq. And he's avoided a lot of that kind of scrutiny of his administration years on because so many critics on the Democratic side are not reflecting so much these days on the Bush years as they may have in a more traditional time, uh, but all, all on President Trump. And I don't think he minds being out of the spotlight and he's not going to get back in in any way. Bob? Okay. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree I, with that. Also, he, also has a, he also has, there are people in the Bush family with political aspirations inside the Republican Party, and I don't think he wants to damage those. But John Kerry's back. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he I do think there's a window for Bush and Obama together, not on a partisan level, but on a defend the institution level, if we have a delayed absentee ballot count after election day and Trump is casting all kinds of noise about how the election was stolen and these millions of uncounted ballots are all fake and they have to be immediately thrown in the river. That's where there could be a joint Bush Obama moment for a little bit of civic leadership that could be very important and very powerful. But as far as partisan stuff, I think it would be more of that from Obama than Bush. Also not Bush's style. He's of the old school of retired presidents stay publicly pretty retired. But I have no doubt that in the precinct he votes in in Dallas, the Republican number this year will be below normal. Uh, <laughs> I would bet money on that. Uh, here's a question from uh, uh, Dave Gutman. Lately, Biden has been hit from the left for not coming out stronger for the Green New Deal and banning fracking. Does this help or hurt? And how should Biden play this? Bob Schramm, you're you're, I think uh, it would have been I would have been a disaster in Pennsylvania if he had come out against all fracking. He wasn't going to do it. Uh, he has said uh, no more public lands will be leased for fracking, but private fracking can go ahead. Uh, I think the complaints on the left, and I say all the time, by the way, that the Twitterverse is not the universe of Democratic voters or the universe of voters. Period. Uh, the, all the noise on the left of the Democratic Party comes, I think from a relatively small group of people. I have to, for example, give a lot of credit to Bernie Sanders, who has worked very hard to unite the party, has worked very hard to support Biden, uh, has not pushed him on these issues at all, uh, and understands that the highest priority here is to defeat Trump. Uh, so I, I don't think this is hurting Biden at all. Yeah, I think the one problem Biden doesn't have is a bunch of progressive activists being so mad that he's not enough for the Green New Deal, they're going to switch their votes to Trump. I mean, they may stay We're home, not. some of them, but I agree with you. I mean, you think back to Philadelphia when we were there in Philly in 16, and I remember walking through the halls of the Wells Fargo Center and the Bernie people were just so frustrated with uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz with the DNC, with Secretary Clinton, and this time, maybe they don't love Vice President Biden, but they got they got a Representative Jayapal and Ocasio Cortez uh, all on these task forces, these unity task forces. And every time I talk to uh, Senator Sanders, just sat with him the other day, he just keep he leads his conversation with the existential threat in his view of, to democracy from President Trump, and he's telling his people, "You better vote. You better be with Biden." And then he, he says he can't wait to lean in on Biden on Medicare for all, but only in January. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, frankly, you could take every single voter in AOC's district and they all stay home and it wouldn't make a lick of difference in the Electoral College. Uh, they're heavily concentrated, you know, with the exception of some vital college towns like Madison, Wisconsin and Ann Arbor, Michigan in big urban centers that are already in safe democratic states. But I think I agree too that Bernie's been great. 
Bernie's gone from being the prickly outsider to like a Chicago ward boss, pull your lever for your fine slate of endorsed Democratic candidates. It's incredible. And I give him a big salute for that. I think he has his, has his priorities right, and that's hard to do in politics when you've lost. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is kind of a similar question, but I'll ask it from Judith Harris. Can you comment on the effects on presidential and down ticket races of Republican lawmakers deafening silence on the Atlantic article re Trump denigrating the military and on Woodward's tapes regarding Trump's lying about the perniciousness of C-19 from the quote get go. And I'm gonna put uh, Judith down as undecided in the presidential race. <laughs> Uh, Good question. I, what, we, what do we we say? talked about this before. I think we don't know yet. Uh, I, you know, I have the theory that the Woodward stuff will have legs and we'll move on. The Atlantic stuff could clearly have legs if you get more and more retired generals yeah. uh, and retired military coming out and talking about it. I mean, General Zini was on television this morning and he is really, really angry at Trump. And you could tell it. And he worked for Trump. He was his uh, ambassador to Qatar or a special envoy to Qatar. So, but I think in general, you, you don't know yet. And one thing that astounds me, that astounds me, I, I don't know if it astounds me, but has impressed me is we get stories that in any other presidential year would have run for weeks and weeks and weeks, or at least for a week. And they tend to disappear after a day or two. Because there's always some, a new one. You know, there's it's Trump, another, he's a machine. There's another outrage. There's yeah. another outrage. So it's outrage piled on outrage, and people kind of get used to it. Yeah, uh, no, in fact, well, that, for me, that, you know, that brings up that, I think, again, about the Access Hollywood tape. People thought that was going to kill Trump, uh, and it didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. It lowered people's estimation of him. Go ahead, Robert. But it no, killed I him for a week. The problem was it was way too early. You know, the wrong week. The thing that has st stuck in the back of my mind since 2016 are two trips. I took a trip to Wisconsin and wrote about the Milwaukee suburbs two weeks before, about two, three weeks before the election in 16. And I went to all these Starbucks and talked to white educated voters in the Milwaukee suburbs. And four or five, it take, the first question I asked them is who you're supporting. They said, I hate them both, I hate them both. And I, I know Clinton's not running this time, but it took four or five questions in for them to admit they were voting for President Trump. And whenever I asked them about Access Hollywood or character issues, they didn't seem to care, a lot of these independent and Republican voters. Democrats did, but the, those voters did not as much. Money mattered. And when I drove across Pennsylvania in the final week of the campaign, I did a whole road trip for the Post, money, money, money over character in terms of what they think they're getting ripped off by the government on taxes or other people ripping off the government. And I was struck, and I told this to my editors at the Post, in our circle, sometimes in the newsroom, we believe these character-driven stories are enormous, of enormous consequence, but I don't always see it yeah. anecdotally. I'm not saying it's in polls, anecdotally in my reporting. And I just think, again, by, to your point, uh, Bob, for Biden to address the Woodward book, but then stick with his economic speech was a key thing for him, perhaps. I'm not a strategist like you both, but I, I just am always reminded when I go out on the trail, how much the economy sometimes, I'm not saying this is good or bad, but the economy matters more than character. Yeah, I think voters vote their self-interest or what they perceive it to be. So I've got one great question to finish on, but quickly I'm going to slip in a moderator's question. I also have an announcement to make that according to Zoom Background Magazine, Costa, you've won an award for cleverly putting that Washington Post pillow back there yes. in the background. So <laughs> that, the, the crafty Thank award you to goes the Washington to Bob. Post. Look, the yeah. Washington Post PR department is trying to get the best and brightest from USC to apply to our <laughs> internships and no. we're doing our job here. We want Trojans. You can subscribe at WashingtonPost.com, a great national newspaper with indispensable coverage now. And you can keep up with Bob's work on Twitter, too. Here's my quick question. Then I'll, I'll wrap up with one more we just got from the audience. What's being missed in the campaign? What's the story that's not getting enough attention as we start to close this campaign that's kind of on your radar screen? Well, so we see these Trump boat parades, right? And they're usually kind of middle class, upper middle class uh, white voters. They're dangerous too. We're up to five sinkings, but yeah, I go know. ahead. I saw Dave Weigel 
my colleague was joking the other day about like, does Antifa have a navy? You know, they take it down these <laughs> posts. But uh, I just, I, it's hard for us as reporters at the Post and elsewhere to really gauge Trump's base uh, amid all of this the pandemic, the economy sliding, these controversies, the military alleged comments, the Woodward book. If he was going, if there was no pandemic and he was going to arena, minor league hockey arena to minor league hockey arena, would he be having 10, 15,000 people? What would the level of enthusiasm be in Michigan, Wisconsin? And it's just hard to gauge it. We have polls, which really matter, but we can't really see Trump in action. And I think that we saw was hit in the final month of 2016, it was, I was flying around covering that campaign. You could see the electricity. Yeah. We didn't think necessarily he was going to win, but you could see it. And we just can't see it. And for Biden, there may be a groundswell for Biden, but he's doing these isolated events and it's hard to gauge what it's really like for him with the, with the kind of the, the swing voter. My favorite hypothetical is if Barry Goldwater had boat parades, would they be longer than Trump's? But I, I take your point. If you're a white person, especially a male between 50 and 64, it, it's heavily Trump. And, you know, that's where a lot of boat owners are. Uh, here's the big question to finish on from Kathleen Beck. Will Congress, and this is right out of today's headlines because we're in the middle of this, will Congress not being able to pass another stimulus package hurt Trump or will it backfire on the Democrats and hurt Biden? This is the game of chicken that's being played today in the Senate. I'm not sure they won't eventually pass something because politicians like to show up with money in October of election years. But Bob, what's your take on that? Uh, first, Bob Costa, then Bob Schrump. My quick take is that it is a game of chicken right now between Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, and Speaker Pelosi. The president is telling everybody behind the scenes, based on what I've heard, that he wants to send another round of stimulus checks out. But if Democrats are going to do this, they want direct aid to states that they can use for schools. And so that it's going to be if there's a deal or not. But I can tell you one thing, talking to top Democrats in the Congress, they trust Speaker Pelosi to not blink that she believes the Republicans, the incumbent president, will be the ones twisting in the wind if the economy's in a painful position and the Republicans are making all these requests for different things they want, payroll tax cut, their kind of pay, payout for, for Americans and stimulus checks. So Speaker Pelosi, as much as Biden's the nominee, she's really running the party right now on this front. Yeah, you know, yeah. just quickly, and then Bob, you take us home. I hear from Democrat friends, too, that Pelosi is not afraid of the politics of no stimulus package. She thinks Trump's got the hot potato. And if he's not sending checks out, people know the Democrats will show up and Joe Biden is not a slow guy off a check. Uh, so she I, no I, fear. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think it's also true that Democrats genuinely believe that you've got to get aid to state and local governments. These governments have to balance their budgets. Their, their, their revenues are collapsing. Uh, so they're going to hold their ground. They're going to hold their ground on, for example, aid to the post office. Uh, and if there is a deal, and I suspect Trump will get more and more nervous about the lack of one as we head into October, uh, the Democrats are going to get a lot of what they want. Uh, so this has been a terrific hour. And I want to thank you, Robert Costa. Uh, we'll all see you tomorrow night on Washington Week. Uh, you are an extraordinary reporter. And you have a really fine sense of what people are thinking. And I, want, I, I also want to thank all the people who joined us. Uh, and if you want to tune into future election R&D episodes, uh, just Google USC Center for the Political Future. Uh, the website will come up first. Hit it, and you'll see all the future events, and you can register for them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. And thank you again, Robert. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, Bob, thank you to you and Mike and to USC. I, I think USC is so lucky to have both of you because one thing I just love as a reporter, people who really know and understand politics and love politics and to bring joy to it in times that are very tough. You guys bring joy and depth. And so just as a reporter and a friend, I appreciate that. Well, thank, thank you, you, Bob. And yeah. thank you, Bob. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Okay.